You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This shift like from that passer to Derek Carr and then, you know, just your acclimation to. I mean, anytime you change quarterbacks from, you know, a Hall of Famer to Hall of Famer, you we're going to go ahead and, and start Jarrett uh, the last couple games of the season here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Backernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, Packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, Pack underscore Dada. Um, so yeah, I was I was supposed to uh, play that clip yesterday, but it's too good to pass up, and so there you go. Come on, it's funny. All right, so today is the day we start getting serious, um, and forget about everybody else's perspective on the game. We start to form some actual real opinions on uh, the Green Bay Packers and the Minnesota Vikings so that we can come to the best possible conclusion on um, what we think is going to happen in in the game. Um, but as I said yesterday, I want to occasionally check in with our rivals to the south, maybe the Lions if something comes up, but I'm just I'm just I'm just concerned. Um, it's been a rough year. It's been a long year. And um, I just want to make sure they're doing okay because I, you know, I know it can be tough when, when you're uh, a little more hopeful than, uh, think, you know, think, things just didn't exactly turn out the way you wanted. And when you're one of the worst teams in football, not that I would necessarily know what it's like to be a fan of a team that's one of the worst in football, but um, I would imagine it sucks a lot. So, um why don't we just start with with checking in on them? We'll get back to the Vikings and just as as the day goes along, we'll just keep poking our head in and, and see how they're doing. So just real quick. I would think that we can all agree that this has been as far as moving the franchise forward and everything that's happened since nineteen eighty five, this has mm-hmm. to be this could be a different show, but top five best bears year since then. Okay. Well, that's with the assumption that it all works out. Yes, it's a big assumption, but it, <laughs> but but we, but we but we have legitimate hope. I think it's been an amazing Bears year. The quarterback is good. We've literally never been able to say that. Oh boy. Okay. All right. All right. It might be worse than I thought, but um, we're listen. If there's any Bears fans out there, just know. I mean, you know, some things are bigger than football, and if you're struggling. Reach out, okay. Um, boy, I didn't. I didn't know it was. It was getting that bad. Oh man, best Bears years. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna stay in character here. <laughs> the Bears are three and twelve. <laughs> oh man, three and twelve. And they, they have gotten to the point where they are so deluded. And you, listen to me. Listen to me real quick. Do you want to know why I keep hammering the Justin Fields thing so much? Because this is what I'm dealing with. This is how insane Bears fans have become. This is the level of psychotic, insane delusion that we're dealing with. 100% this is the best year as far as moving the franchise forward, because we have this great coach and great quarterback and great GM and one of the best draft classes ever, and we're going to be so good. Well, do we know any of that? Well, no, we don't, actually. We don't know any of that, but uh, assuming that's all true, this is the best year since 1985. And next year, we're going to get Elton Jenkins, and we're going to get Deron Payne, and we're going to get J.J. Watt, and we're going to get all these guys, because I don't know if you know this, but Elton Jenkins plays for a team that um, doesn't have a, a future at quarterback and they don't have any money, so they can't pay him. And J.J. Watt, his uh, girlfriend slash wife, whatever, plays soccer in Chicago, so it's almost guaranteed that that they're going to be there. And Deron Payne is going to come play defensive tackle for us, despite the fact that Washington has already said there's no way we're going to let him walk, we're going to pay him, and they're obviously going to have plenty of money. Oh, and Laramie Tunsil is a tackle for the Houston Texans, is pretty, pretty much the only good football player out there. and. Um, 
is uh, sa- his salary cap hit is about thirty five million dollars for the Texans next year, so they could make him the highest paid tackle in football, and they would save money in doing so. But but they're probably just going to let him walk, and then we get to pay him, and it's going to be great. And then we win the Super Bowl after going three and twelve. Okay. Anyways, uh, again, if 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 you're having problems, please reach out. Okay. Don't do this to yourself. Because this is getting dangerous. It's getting to the point where I'm worried that if next year you guys miss the playoffs or win three, four, five games again, they might need to open up a few institutions in the state of Illinois. I'm just saying. And I don't mean prisons necessarily. I'm just talking places where people need, you know, a nice, safe place to sleep. You know what I mean? A little extra padding on the walls. I'm worried about you guys, okay? We love you up here. We're here for you. We're going to keep laughing at you, but we, we're here for you. Anyways, I want to look at something uh, real quick because I had uh, Mr. Peter uh, send me something here. This is looking at the... Uh, it's, it's borderline getting tiring, but I understand if you're a Vikings fan... Uh, why you would maybe go to these lengths to try to prove that you're not a fraud. But there is a thread here by, who is this? Luke Braun from, uh, which thing is he on? Score North or something? Locked on Vikings. He says, the Vikings have won 12 games. 11 of them them have been one score. That implies these crazy contests hinging on one or two bounces of the ball. But WP graphs for these games suggest otherwise. Win probability, that is. Here's the one uh, against Green Bay. Da, 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 da. So the point being, if you look at these graphs, you'll see that there really wasn't a point at which things could have flipped. The, the Vikings were largely in control for most of these games. Um, the issue I have is that's not really true. It is for the, Viking, or the Vikings-Packers game week one. Um, I think, because you can't really... These are just images, but I found where he found these things. Uh, It looks like week one in particular for that Vikings game, the closest it ever, aside from like the start of the game, the closest it ever got was 61% in the Vikings favor. And that was with 1047 left in the second. After that, it was just, and that was just a slight dip. We must've scored a touchdown and then it was all Vikings after that. (sighs) After that, you really start getting into nuance to the point where it becomes almost ridiculous that we're kind of doing this. I did find an article on 538 where they kind of talked about this, and they talked about where, you know, rather than finding, you know, they use an example of a game in which a a team here, I think it's the Saints, were up 21-0, 27-7. It ended 33-27, and the point is they scored like three garbage time touchdowns. The last one as regulation expired. So that really shouldn't count as a one score game. And so what they did is they said, how about we look at it and say, if it's a 60-40 split at some point with five minutes left, we'll call that a true one score game. Now, first of all, before we get into this, um, I think that's generally fair. I, I, the, the problem I had is I didn't really understand the math behind it because I don't know if you necessarily have to go back and find that thing. In fact, I know that you don't. Find that exact moment where this is where everything, ch- that one call would have changed everything. That's not really the point. The point is if it gets close enough, or if it, the point is if it is close, actually close, then it's considered a one-score game, and any little thing could have changed it. The only reason you would throw it out is if it wasn't actually close. So again, week one wasn't close, but that wasn't a one-score game. So I don't know why he even included that. Because, I mean, again, doesn't really prove anything about your one-score games when this is the one -one non-one-score game of the season. Although, to be fair, he also goes on to say that uh, some of these are eight points, and that shouldn't be one score. I've also seen some articles written basically saying eight points is not a one-score game. Whatever. Again, this it gets so nitpicky to the point of being kind of silly. But let's go through a couple of these, shall we? Week two, they lost, so we don't need to worry about that. Week three is a true coin flip game. Detroit was favored by 80% with um, 
one minute and 10 seconds left. Detroit had 80% odds to win that game. So that's a true coin flip game. Uh, The next week, it was 55-45 in the Minnesota's favor with a minute 56 left. So there's a coin flip game. The next several are coin flip-ish insofar as if we hold to a strict five minutes, it's not a coin flip. But considering that's arbitrary, I think it's silly that we say, oh, nope, it's not a coin flip because it was actually six minutes instead of five minutes, which is the situation in most of these games. Weirdly, six, the six-minute mark is where the Vikings must turn it on because <laughs> it's like every single week, oh, here goes the six-minute and then the Vikings take off. But the Bears game was actually almost exactly 50-50 um, with, I can't go exactly minute by minute. This thing is not super great, so it's hard to exactly tell, but about six and a half minutes left, it was exactly 50-50. And look, it, it's this entire... So, so the Bears started surging back and um, got themselves within 40% in the fourth quarter with 12 minutes left. They got all the way up to 57% with nine minutes left. And so between basically 12 minutes in the fourth quarter all the way until about five and a half minutes in the fourth quarter, it was a 50-50 ball game. And at this point, there must have been a touchdown here somewhere. Um, Minnesota pulled away. But it's very easy to see where that coin flip takes place in this game. Week six against Miami would be another one that's that's pretty firmly in the category of Minnesota because they were favorites um, almost the entire game. Um, Miami was 51% at some point in the second. So this really would be so far the only example of a game in which, you know, I mean, even this is kind of weird because I mean, the Vikings didn't break out beyond 60% until around halftime, and then they just kind of maintained control throughout. Um, But it actually does look like there is a last-second touchdown by the Miami Dolphins at the end of the game to bring it within seven. So this would probably be one of those games that is not a coin flip. But again, the issue is, that's true of every team. I mean, you go back to 2019 Packers. Well, there were frauds, and you know we can't just adjust down the Vikings, and then say, see, they're not number one in history because some of these get, well, then you have to go back throughout all of history and do this to every team to see if they are still one of the teams. Because again, this happens to everybody. There's one last second garbage touchdown to bring it within seven when really we were up by 14 pretty much the entire game. Anyways, I don't want to go through every single game, but uh, let's see, uh, week seven was a bye. Week eight, there was a coin flip around, it was in the fourth quarter, probably around 11 minutes. So... Again, if we're holding to the strict five minutes, then that would be firmly in the Vikings' camp. Um, but again, is there that moment where you can identify, you know, this is where things could have gone either way? Well, yes, this is, I mean, it's not one of those where they were firmly in the lead the entire game and then there was some garbage time comeback. That's not really the case. So whatever, draw your own conclusions on that. Week nine was another six minute flip. So it was 60 40 at six minutes left. Week 10, they got stomped out 40 to three. Oh no, week 10 was a, a coin flip game. Week 11, they got stomped out. Week 12, again, it's, it, it was a 50-50 game the entire game until uh, 11 minutes left in the fourth, and then the Vikings just took off with it. So do what you want with that. Uh, the Jets game was absolutely a true coin flip. Uh, it was 50-50 with 30 seconds left. And again, I think that's what a lot of Vikings fans want, is unless you can point to a last-second win, it doesn't count. Yes, it does. Most one-score games don't come down to the last minute or 30 seconds or a last-minute field goal or a last second. It's not about last second. It's a whole butterfly effect throughout the entire game that could have changed the course of things. And so you can probably throw that out if, you know, sort of like that, uh, how the Colts are up 33 to nothing. You know, that's where it's like you look at the Colts and say, okay, there's no way. Oh, wait, they did come back and win. But anyways, usually (laughs) there are circumstances where you're ahead by so much, you just assume there's no ball bouncing that could have change this. Like we dominated you the entire game and then you started coming back and scored a ton of touchdowns, but it wasn't enough because we beat you by so much. If it's 50-50 the entire game and then you score a touchdown in the fourth quarter and just kind of hold on to control, I think there's a lot of ways the balls could have bounced earlier on that could have given, for example, the Patriots another touchdown in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Week 14, they got beat by the Lions. Week 15 was another last second win. Um, it was 
Jeez. F- with uh, five seconds left, Minnesota had a 47% chance of winning the game. Indy had a 10% chance, but still. <laughs> so weird when that happens. And then against the Giants, it was the same thing. It was, uh, if we go for the 60-40, it looks like uh, with 29 seconds left, the Vikings had a 57% chance, the Giants had a 42% chance. So as far as I can tell, that Miami game is the only one where they were comfortably ahead, and it only got to within one score because of a garbage time thing. If you want to hold to 538 strict five minutes, then there were a bunch But again, unless you're going to go back and look at every single other team, it's hard to not call these one score. So, I mean, I I, I get the theory behind it, but I don't even know that this necessarily proves anything if you look at it. I mean, again, he just posted screenshots, but you can even see within the screenshots that it got close. His, His whole point is, well, the Vikings were ahead for most of the game. That's not really the point. If you were ahead for most of the game... And with five minutes left, it got to 50-50, and then you pulled ahead and win. It it doesn't make sense to say, well, we were winning most of the game, so you shouldn't call that a one-score game. Well, of course I can. If it got to 50-50 with five minutes left and you pulled ahead, of course it's a coin flip game. So, I mean, this this is getting, again, in my mind, into the realm of of silliness, trying to prove too much. Um, Again, I, I, at the end of the day, there's two ways of looking at this. Number one is they earned their record, in which case they really are that good, in which case Vegas is wrong, right? Vegas is wrong because they, they've been, again, they've been extremely disrespectful to the, to the Vikings. They were extremely disrespectful to the Vikings to say that the Vikings should be underdogs against the Lions, but the Lions won. It was extremely disrespectful to put them at three and a half point favorites only at home against one of the worst teams in football, the Colts. They didn't cover the spread and were down 33 to nothing at one point. And then again, we're like four point favorites, four and a half point favorites the next week against the Giants, who have won like one game in seven weeks. And they didn't cover that spread either. What I'm saying is, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm trying to decide does this look to me more like an eight, nine win team or a true top team? Like, th- th- does this look more like something the Packers would do or more like something the Chiefs would do? Would the Chiefs lose to the Lions? barely beat the Colts in overtime and barely beat the Giants in the last second? Or is that something like the Packers beating the Bears and the Rams and Miami in the last seconds and everybody going, "Eh, yeah, that doesn't even count. They got gifted. They played garbage teams and they still didn't look that good. What does it sound more like to you? So again, we can get nitpicky here, but the reality is the Vikings uh, uh, in no way look like a 13-win football team. The statistics are not of a 13-win football team. The scores are not of a... The only thing that makes them a 13-win team is the 13 wins. But if you actually look at the quality of the team, there isn't much that makes them that way. And I even compared them to Miami because they're so explosive and everything else, although they have a worse defense. What is Miami's record? When I say I'm scared of Detroit or of uh, Minnesota, I am. Just like I'm scared of a lot of teams that are not... I'm, I'm scared of Detroit. They don't have a good record. I'm scared of Miami. They don't have a good record. I'm scared of a lot of teams that don't have a good record. The question is, though, is everybody wrong about the Vikings and they're actually as good as their record says or not? And I don't think there's any way that you can look at not just the wins, but the quality of the wins and also just the quality of the team, the offense, the defense, the special teams. If you had to put them on a tier in terms of how dangerous they are, where would you put them? Would you put them up with the 49ers? I mean, I know they beat the Bills, but let's just look at the, the, at that division. Are they more like the Bills or are they more like the Dolphins? They're more like the Dolphins. Are they more of a Bengals team or, or are they more of a... Uh, yeah, maybe that's not... I would say they're probably better than Pittsburgh. Although I don't know what Pittsburgh is anymore. I think they're on a win streak. Are they more like the Chiefs or the Chargers? Much more like the Chargers at 9-6 and six than they are like the Chiefs at 12-3. and three. Right? And again, when I look at the Vikings, Lions, and Packers, I see three pretty evenly matched teams. That's what I see. And the, and the Packers and Lions are 7 and 8, and the Vikings are 12 and 3. The funny, th- the funny thing is, when I was looking into all this data on 50-50 stuff, uh, one-score games or whatever, they, they went back to 2019 and actually flipped everything. And this is what upset, you know, Vikings fans loved the article, and Packer fans hated it. It was 538, but they, uh, maybe it wasn't 530, it might have been a different one, but... Um, they flipped it. 
And you know what the records were? The Vikings were 11 and 4, and the Packers are 8 and 7. Almost identical to what we're seeing this year. In 2019, the Packers got really lucky, and the Vikings got unlucky. The Packers were whatever their record was, and the Vikings were whatever their record was. But if you flip it, you get 2022. And the funny thing is, in 2019, you had Packer fans saying, nah uh, and Vikings fans saying, you're frauds. And now it's the exact opposite. Vikings fans are saying, nah uh, and Packers fans are saying, you're frauds. And now I got to parse through threads about, yeah, well, technically, if you look at it in the win probability and blah, 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 blah. Come on, man. I mean, I get it. I, I understand what you're saying. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to the quality of the team. And what I'm saying is the Vikings have been consistently underestimated. And every week, it's proven correct to underestimate the Vikings. Again, the Buffalo Bills game is the only game in my mind that was impressive. And it was impressive. Every other game in which they were underdogs, they lost. Minor, minor underdogs, they lost. And this is, this is the next one up. So that's my thought on the 50-50 thing. I think it's fair to maybe throw some out. The problem is I can't go back throughout history and readjust everything else to find out what the standard is and where the Vikings are based on that. Um, I can tell you where the Vikings are based on the 538 standard, based on you know whatever, just kind of looking at it. Again, throw out the Miami a game being close. Fair enough. They dominated that game and the and the the Dolphins scored like a last second. I think it was literally last second because it was 16. So if I had to guess they had 10 and then it was with zero I, I don't know, but you know how at the end of the game if you score a touchdown they don't kick the extra point that would keep it at 16. It's just a guess on my part. I don't remember. So yeah, you can throw that out. The rest of them, mm, every single one of them was pretty close to 50-50 at some point in the fourth quarter. And the other thing is, you know, Football Outsiders did an article on this and, and talked about how, you know, if you have a, a really good record in one score games that you expect regression to the mean. In other words, we would expect your team to be not as good moving forward. So the question is, should we expect the Vikings moving forward to be a 13 win team? Or do we think based on the information that they're probably not going to be that next year? I would bet that they're not going to be that because that's what historically has always really been the case. And again, it, it's silly to have to argue this because Vikings fans, again, they know this because to start the season, the biggest argument in favor that, that I talked about on this podcast that I thought made the most sense for the Vikings being a good football team is how historically bad they've been in one score games. And if you actually look at the quality of their team based on this whole coin flip method, they're actually quite a bit better. And if they just got, and I said this about the Bears after the 2017 season. And it wasn't even based on any of this data. I just remember they were, they were so unlucky. In like the last 30 seconds, they'd throw a pick or something weird would happen just constantly. And I said, if, if, if you just kind of throw that out, you know, a lot of these games, they're, they're going to be much better in 2018. And they, they freaking dominated in 2018. But yes, the quality of the team did get better. But, but just by virtue of the fact that their losses weren't all really legitimate losses. So it's not just pure bias. Again, I've, I've, I stated it in favor of the Vikings this year. I stated it in favor of the Bears back in the 2017-2018 year. I'm just being consistent and asking for consistency from Vikings fans on this issue that everybody else can see pretty clearly. Anyways, before we move on, uh, I just want to, again, check in with our friends down south and make sure they're doing okay. So when you look at 2022, yes, it has been depressing. Yes, a lot of things have gone wrong. Yeah. Yes, there have been a lot of losses, right. but it, if you're a hopeful, if you're hopeful and you're optimistic, it just represents a beginning. State of the art QB. I, I I wouldn't even like if we're underlining what's gone wrong. I'm having I I have a hard time doing that. Bears fans, I want to I want to tell you about a, a phone number you can call if you need some help. Six zero eight five zero one zero seven one eight is is a phone number. If you want to reach out, if you're having problems, if you're if you're finding yourself saying that I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding anything that went wrong this season, um, if you're saying things like state-of-the-art quarterback that I don't, honestly, I don't know what that means, um, I, I, would, I would say that you are unwell and you need to call in. 608-501-0718, that is the number to call. If you need some help, if you need someone to reach out to, I will... In, in the only way I know how, I will help you, okay? Because these are, these are tough times. I get it, right? Everything's gone wrong. 
Uh, Pace has shipped everybody off that was any good at doing anything. And I know you said it wouldn't matter because you have Darnell Mooney and this great quarterback. And, and um, you know, you're excited about these offensive line pieces that you got. They're actually really good. They're not that bad, as everyone said. And I, I know you said that Khalil Mack wasn't really doing anything. So it doesn't matter if he's not on the team because you're still going to have this great defense. And it turns out they suck. And I like I, I understand that you thought that there was no way Roquan would leave and he got shipped off. And and I, I understand that things have been rough. And I know that three wins is not what you expected. And I know that deep down inside, you know that a three-win team is probably not going to just turn around and become a Super Bowl contender, um, even if you do manage the number one overall pick, because that's just not really how that works, especially when you already have the quarterback and that guy can't even drag you to four wins because, you know, he's not that good. But listen. This this is this is a this is a low point that I've never seen any fan base of any team ever reach. This is really sad and honestly it's really scary and I just want you to know I'm here for you, okay? Anyways, this is um I said I wanted to get a little bit more into betting. This isn't exactly that. This is CBS, but but these are guys that kind of look at it a little bit more seriously. And again, it's just I don't I don't I don't I'm trying to make this a non-biased thing. Clearly, I'm biased. Clearly, I'm anti-Vikings and pro-Packers. But, but I, I just I want to interject some reality into this. Here, here is uh, what they had to say on CBS. They've got a plus five differential. Right. So that makes them fraudulent. At this, it's it's as a 12-win team. It's amazing. I, it's unbelievable. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And they're not going to win this game either. Rogers is going to take one look at that shell coverage defense and just go ding, ding, ding. He can go right down the field and, and score whenever he wants to. Kirk Cousins will score too, by the yeah. way. High scoring game. I like the Packers. They need it more. Seeding, not as important as getting in. So I'll take the Packers minus the points. I'm laying the three and a half. I would probably buy it down to an even three because I do think it could be close. I mean, look, the Packers continually cannot stop the run. Dalvin Cook could have a big game where, you know, it's just Kirk Cousins. But if play Dalvin Cook's have- By the way, Funny enough, when I looked at uh, yesterday, I was talking about how the guy said that um, Kirk Cousins hasn't lost in Green Bay. He's only won once in Green Bay. And in that game, it wasn't even Kirk Cousins. He had a garbage day. It was actually Dalvin Cook that did it. He was the guy that got that win. Having a big game. And by the way, Justin, Justin Jefferson's not. Well, it's not that he's not. It's just Dalvin Cook could have a big game. Then off of that, Justin Jefferson gets 12, 14 targets and has a bunch of catches and a bunch of yards. Him versus J.L. Alexander is going to be a fun matchup to watch in this one. Uh, but Jefferson's been phenomenal this year. You're talking about Cousins. So is Jefferson. He deserves a lot He's of credit. In the MVP record. conversation. He should be. Yep, He's absolutely. played that well. But, again, this is one where I think we see kind of that, that plus five point differential, however that you want to spin that. I think it plays its factor here. Green Bay has won two in a row now. They're on a roll. Rodgers knows what's three in Three in a row. Him. I'll lay the three and a half. Does that say something, though, that on a team that's 12 and three, and scoring a lot of points that we're talking about the wide receiver is the MVP and not the quarterback? Uh, I just think Justin Jefferson has gone kind of above and beyond, though. <laughs> but any- Anyways, the, the point is, that, and the reason I like this, is they're acknowledging everything good about the Vikings, and they're still picking the Packers, right? The Vikings still have something to play for. The Vikings have a wide receiver who could potentially be MVP. I had heard Vikings fans talking about maybe, maybe Kirk and... Um, and Jefferson get MVP votes. Uh, I doubt it, but but the point is, Kirk is playing really good football right now, which is actually how this segment started. They were talking about how good Kirk is playing right now. Um, they're acknowledging that Dalvin is a good football player, and the Packers can't stop the run, and that is a disaster. And so you'll have Dalvin Cook getting a bunch of yards and Justin Jefferson. So essentially, this defense of, of the Packers is going to get carved up. And still, the best they can say is it might be close. The Packers will win and it might be close. It's amazing to me. And again, what, what um, Brady Quinn said here is that, you know, that, that fraudulent title is going to rear its head here. And I could see Vikings fans saying, if, if the fraudulent thing was going to rear its head, why hasn't it by now? The point is, though, it kind of has. The last time they were underdogs was against Detroit, and they lost. The time before that they were underdogs was Dallas, and they lost. The time before that was Buffalo, and they won. Again, very impressive. The last time before that they were underdogs was against Philadelphia, and they lost that game too. You know, if if the point is, if we were frauds, why didn't we lose to the Colts? Come on, man. (laughs) That can't be your argument. If we were frauds, why didn't we lose to the Jets? Why didn't we lose to the Giants? I mean, these are teams, I mean, legitimately, the, the Giants, Colts, and Jets have each won one game since, what, week 11? 
uh, actually the Colts haven't won since week. The Colts have won one game since week seven. The Jets have won one game since week, well, I could say 10 if I wanted to be unfair, but that was a bye week since week 11. And the Giants have won one game since week 11. So since week 11, the three teams combined for two wins. And, 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 and again, yeah, in the Packers, the team the Packers have played have been bad. That, the point isn't that, you know, it, it doesn't count. I've been saying it counts. A win still counts. But if we're saying that we're not fraudulent because I don't think you can look at an underwhelming win against your last three, the last four games have been a one score win against a Jets team that cannot win football games, a loss to the Lions pretty convincingly. I mean, you, you talk about one score, that wasn't one score. That was an 11 point loss. Then an overtime field, last second field goal win against the Colts. I guess it wasn't really last second. Technically it was because the game ended, but who haven't won a game since, what did I say, week seven? And then a uh, field goal win against, again, a last second field goal win against the Giants who haven't won since week 10. I mean, uh, excuse me, they have, they have one win since week 11, I think. So when he says, we're going to see what it is that makes them frauds in this game, that's what they're talking about. The Packers are not the Jets, the Packers are not the Colts, the Packers are not the Giants. Even if they're not good, which is what most people are saying, the Packers are not that good, even still, the last four weeks have just been screaming the Vikings are frauds. Screaming it. Even New England. You look at it, well, New England's not that bad. They're a 7-8 and team. They started off the season 5-4, and right. Uh, Since their bye week, though, they are uh, 2-4. and They've won one game since week uh, 12. That was against the Cardinals. The Vikings lost uh, to the Raiders week, or excuse me, the, uh, the New England Patriots just lost to the Raiders in week 15. That's not great. They beat the Jets prior to losing to the Vikings 10 to 3. The Jets. Again, remember how bad the Jets are? New England beat them 10 to 3. Freaking yikes. And I think that's kind of the point. Again, and, 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 and I, that's what I've been saying is, is so astounding is that the Packers aren't really getting credit. It's just, yeah, the, the Packers suck, but the Vikings suck worse, which seems ridiculous, but it's, it's just staring you right in the face. Anyways, before we go to break, let's check in one more time on, the, on, on our friends to the south and uh, just make sure that they're doing a little bit better. Again, the phone number is 608-501-0718. Um, the one that probably... Could be ranked number one if we were to rank these. It probably is. I don't know if it's at the top, but it's definitely probably in the top two. But just in general, the regime change. So going all the way back to January of last year, and we're grouping these together, but the firing of Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy Woo! And, fl- <laughs> and flipping that into the hiring of Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus, just setting the stage for everything else that's happened this year. Wow. Charting a new course everything um, that's happened that was three badly wins, needed everything in starting this rebuild it, it's so amazing to me to hear bears fans doing victory laps about what a great season it's been and one of the greatest things that's happened is the hiring of poles and eberflus that brought us to this great year set the stage for everything else that's happened this year this this is what they've been talking about this whole time what a great thing to bring in Poles and Eberflus. Why? Well, look at what's happened. Look how great this is. Are you kidding me? Have you seen how amazing this is? Uh, hello? The Bears? Greatest in football? Thank you, Poles and Eberflus. Guys, my goodness. Somebody, some, if you have a friend who is a Bears fan, please call them. Check in on them. Give them my number if they, if they need someone to reach out to, okay? Uh, it's getting scary. It's getting scary. Why don't we take a break? We'll come back and look at some more, uh, data on the Packers and Vikings game. So I want to start this off here. Uh, this is a pro Vikings thing. And this, this, this is a couple of, of betting guys. So I, I like their opinion more so than, you know, ESPN and, uh, some of the other blowhards and whatnot. Um, there's not a lot of actual data here, but it's it's at least something to consider that is pro Vikings. We're split, Chad. We are split down the middle. We'll start with the the Green Bay Vikings game. 
I get where they're coming from, why they like Green Bay in this matchup, but I just feel like it's too much disrespect to the Vikings. A three and a half, that's a great number in a divisional game where the, that's who the Vikings are. They play these games close. And if Green Bay was some juggernaut, if this was a 49ers say, okay, I'll give the benefit to that home team, catch a three minus three and a half at home. Yeah, I'll be on the 49ers or against the Vikings. Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, it just isn't what people think they are. They're just not as good as people perceive them. They've had really good matchups here these last couple of weeks and played some bad teams. They've eked out some good wins. So like, I'll give them credit for that. Minus three and a half, though, that just feels like such an overreaction. So interesting hearing that there's pros who actually like Green Bay. They took him at three. They took him at minus two and a half. They still said they'd take him at minus three and a half. I just totally disagree with that one. I get, once again, though, I get where they're coming from. But I'm just on the other side of it. And the same goes for... So that that was it. Um, and, and to be clear, he never went so far as to say that he thinks the Vikings are going to win. He said three and a half is too big of a number. Now, if the number was, you know, minus one, would he take the Packers or would he say that this should be, you know, the Vikings or something? I don't know. He didn't really elaborate on that. Um, I do think it's fair to say that this is what the Vikings do. They find ways to win. They keep games close. I think that is a fair thing to say about the Vikings. And, and, and that's the whole point about the win, one-score win thing. And I said this yesterday. There's, there's two elements to it. There's the 50-50 element, and then there's the, but why are they constantly coming out ahead on these 50-50 games? There's a human element. There's, there's the I'm never giving up element. There's that Tom Brady, you know, never count them out until it's over element. And I think that's a real thing. Now, the benefit for the Packers is they've become that team. You know, again, with the defense being just an absolute juggernaut, not just in the second half, but especially the fourth quarter. And for the Packers, as bad as, as that offense started for them to end the way that they did, particularly Aaron Rodgers, one of the, like I said, one of the worst starts I've ever seen from Aaron Rodgers. And, and it was maybe the best second half I've seen from him all year. So they kind of did the same thing. So um, again, it's, it's not a ton of data and information, not, not, not what I generally expect from these guys. And the other guy didn't even talk. I think he will in the next clip, but uh, that is one thing, minor, <laughs> even though it's not much here, we can put in the Vikings column. That is, the Vikings do a good job of keeping games close and finding ways to eke out wins, even though that's not what he said, I'll, I'll add it in, uh, at, at the end of games or, or finding ways to win one way or another. So here's the same two guys, I guess, talking about it an, another time. Um, I, I want to just let the guy talk, but I just I think his I think his reasoning is entirely flawed. But but let's just run this through real quick. Uh, the Packers are three point favorites on the at home at Lambeau in a must win for them against the Vikings, who continue to find ways. Sixty one yard field goal in the final seconds after nearly blowing it against the Giants. I hate this team. This team will be an auto fade for their season win total next year. Simon says the Vikings. I knew you would hate it. Everyone hates it. Everyone hates this team. I've completely turned the other way where I'm like, okay, this is the team that's going to win the Super Bowl, isn't it? They're going to be an underdog in every playoff game because the public is like you. They're just waiting for them to fail. And Kirk will keep winning these games. So that's problem number one. He says they're going to continue to be underdogs and they're going to continue to find ways to win. They don't win when they're underdogs. They haven't been underdogs. They were favorites against the Giants. They were favorites against the Colts. They were underdogs against the Lions and they lost. They were favorites against the Giants. They were favorites against the Patriots. They were underdogs against the Cowboys and they lost. All right, we've been through all this. They didn't, they're not winning when they're underdogs. The, the, the public says they're frauds and the public doesn't like them, but they're not winning when they're underdogs. They're winning when they're favorites. That's flaw number one in his thinking. On the final couple of seconds, it's bizarre world. Uh, no, the honest real reason for taking this Vikings team is I love the way they match up with Green Bay. I forget when they played. It might have been week one. I think they beat them 23 to seven. So again, and, and you know, I just I, I've heard the, the rationale from these guys. They, they've pulled some great numbers that I've used on the podcast before. Th this just seems entirely flawed, his thinking. The fact that, well, we've seen them play before in week one. Is that really where you're going with this? They absolutely dominated when they played earlier this year. Mm, I mean, it was their only multiple point. Win. They only scored 23 points. The only thing that was dominant was a Packers inept offense against a Vikings decent defense. The Packers offense is no longer inept, and the Vikings defense is maybe the worst in football right now. The offense didn't do anything. 23 points is nothing. It's nothing. Especially when you talk about how many blown coverages there were in that game. 
played him well these last couple of years, even when Rodgers was on his MVP level. Everything Chad's saying is true, where it's like, we're getting an indoor team outdoors, fade. We're getting a team that is probably number two or three in the luck rankings, fade. It's- two or three, it's number one by a mile. Um, and again, he's, he's even admitting, like, look, everything points to the Packers winning, but I just don't think so. I think the Packers, it, it, here's the other thing he's going to talk about. He thinks that everyone is overinflated on the Packers. Nobody is. Nobody thinks the Packers are great. It's just that they don't overestimate the Vikings like he is. It's like everything is screaming fade to this Vikings team. Where I look the other way, where Green Bay has had crazy amount of luck and good fortune these last couple of weeks that is inflating their number. Like people are thinking they're way better than they really actually are. Everyone's thinking, okay, this is the team that's going to backdoor, get their way into the playoffs. The NFL is going to fix it because they want the ratings for Green Bay. They don't give a damn about that. And it's another team where I think they're going to... Again, what, what, what are you talking about? I mean, I, I think they're going to get into the playoffs, but not because they're a great football team, just because that makes the most sense. Washington is a garbage football team and is going to lose one of their next two weeks. The, I mean, the, the, the next couple of games for the Packers is going to be tough. So I'm, I'm kind of 50-50, probably a little, I guess, a little less than 50% that we get in. But again, it's, it's just, I don't think... First of all, most people don't think, from what I've seen, the Packers are going to get in, but we, we've seen it. The argument isn't that the Packers are so good, and it's because they've been so dominant, that's why they're going to beat the Vikings. It's not about that. It's about the Vikings are actually that bad. And he's even, he's acknowledging, and his, his whole thinking, and he's trying to explain around this with different things that don't make any sense, but his whole thing is, he's not buying that the Vikings are frauds. He thinks that this is, this is just a thing. Again, because he's falsely assuming that they keep finding ways to win when they're underdogs and they're not, which he should know that because he, he's, he's a line guy. That's what he does. Look ahead, man. They got Detroit the next week. That's the game. And now he's saying the Packers are going to skip this game because they're looking ahead to Detroit. That's so stupid. First of all, the Vikings are a bigger threat than Detroit. They just are. And even if you don't necessarily agree with that, there's no way in the world they're going to overlook the Minnesota Vikings and look at Detroit. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is just weird. Like that's them and Detroit fighting for that last spot to me. That's the look ahead. That's the game for them. Minnesota, I love when they're just, I love them as dogs, honestly. Like I, we did. Why? You're a numbers guy. Look at their record when they're underdogs. Well, though, right. When we took Cowboys on the road as a favorite against the Vikings. Yeah. That made sense. Like that was a smart number. I don't know. It feels a bit- <laughs> He's bragging about how he picked the Cowboys. Uh, pick the Vikings against the Cowboys. What happened in that game? He said that was smart. That was a smart thing. They lost 40-3. to three. Bit of an overreaction here. Like, I would make this line a pick. This is a coin flip game. You're giving me... Fair enough. Fair enough. But everything you're saying is stupid. Everything you're saying doesn't make any sense. Be three points because everyone's like Chad and f***ing hates his Vikings team and just doesn't want to bet them. Right. And people like Green Bay, they think they're ascending... They've turned it around. Mm. I get everyone's reasoning for being on the Screen Bay team, but I can tell you this. They hung a three and a half with this game, and I was all over it. A lot of pros were all over it. Went down to three, went to two and a half. They were four and a half point dogs last week. Is that because everyone loves Green Bay? He's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. Everybody isn't on the Packers team. They're just entirely off the Vikings team. And by the way, the, the Packers have exceeded the expectations. Oh, they got lucky, and these are barely wins. They, 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 they were four-and-a-half-point underdogs against Miami. They won by six. They were seven-point favorites against the Rams. They won by 12. They were four-and-a-half-point favorites against Chicago. They won by nine. And then against Philly, they were, they were six-and-a-half-point underdogs. They lost by seven. That's, that's exactly what you would expect. Tennessee, they were favorites, but I, I, I told you that was wrong. This is exactly the kind of game that you would expect to lose. Like after that, Dallas, four-point underdogs, one by three. And again, since Dallas, this is just what it's been. The only time they, they underwhelmed was against Tennessee, and I told you that's going to happen. They covered against Dallas. They basically hit the exact spread against Philadelphia. And then the last three weeks in a row, they have blown the line out of the water, which tells you that the public and Vegas and everybody underestimates the Packers, not overestimates underestimates. They overestimate the Vikings. They underestimate the Packers. That's the reality. So look, 
Again, and this just comes down to the reasoning. If, if you're telling me that the Vikings are being underestimated, which I've said, and I think this is closer to a coin flip than a three and a half point Packers favor, that's fine. But don't tell me it's because everybody thinks the Packers are great and everybody's underestimating the Vikings because they do great when they're underdogs. Because that's just flat out incorrect. They are terrible when they're underdogs. They just haven't been underdogs basically all year. So all of that gets thrown out. They haven't proven, again, aside from Buffalo, they have one, one impressive win, I think, on the season. And, and, and I guess the Packers game, although I'm not impressed by it. They seem to be doing backflips about the fact that Justin Jefferson was so great they scored 23 points. But, I mean, I, honestly, this, this is the second part of what he said is kind of closer to where I'm at. And I'm, I'm feeling like I need to move closer to the Packers win because his reasoning for saying it's a coin flip was stupid. Right? He's saying all the information points to fade the Vikings. In other words, forget them. They're going to lose. It's, it's, it's all Packers. However, incorrect, 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 incorrect. Therefore, it's a 50-50 coin flip. Well, all right, I guess I'm not going toward the Vikings. We've got a lot more ground to cover, but, but you know, family first. Or the parallels between the Vikings and Bears are going to be tracked. And right now, I think there's a conversation you can have, probably for a different day, and maybe we'll have it next week because the Bears play the Vikings. It would make more sense. Yeah. But would you rather be the Vikings at 11 and three and going into the playoffs, or the Bears at three and 11, or now they're t- three and 12, 12 and three, um, having potentially the number one pick in the draft? That is such a anti we have no chance in the playoffs take because the Vikings literally could win the Super Bowl this year but I'm I still might actually take the Bears because I would bet against Minnesota in the playoffs and then I'm gonna bet against their future I'm gonna bet on the Bears that's an interesting conversation it is so we'll we'll have ladies and gentlemen let me ask you a question Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, would you rather be the 13-win Vikings on their way to the playoffs or the 3-win Bears because they're going to have maybe a number one overall pick and then are going to win the Super Bowl? Hmm. Yeah. This, so everything's been great this year. In fact, it's so good that I'd rather be the Bears than the Vikings right now. It's amazing. It's such a Bears take, too, who've been like laughing at the Packers because they go to the playoffs every year and lose. Because somehow they've convinced themselves that not going to the playoffs is better than going to the playoffs and losing. Because, you know, then you get high picks, and high picks obviously turn you into a great franchise. Right, Bears fans? Anyways, I know I shouldn't criticize. You guys are uh, struggling down there. And um, again, just here to help. 
608-501-0718. All right. By the way, there's been a lot of talk about the Minnesota Vikings and, you know, they're going to run the ball. I'm not going to play the clip because I want to try to find something that's a little bit better substance than than this nonsense. But, you know, they're, they're, the Vikings haven't run the ball great, but they're going to be able to dominate on the ground against this Packers team. Um, the Vikings offense ranks 25th in rushing, and I'm not talking yards because they throw a lot. I'm talking about yards per attempt. 25th. They are terrible when they run the ball. Miami was held to under 100 rushing yards the last time when we played them last week they ranked 19th in uh and and that's now after being held to less i think it was higher than that prior to the packers game in fact the last two weeks have been uh some of the lowest rushing totals aside from tampa bay who was held to 34 rushing yards the lowest rushing yards against this defense have been 72 and 82. 72 is week 15 against the Rams. 82 is week 16 against the Dolphins. 155 yards by the Bears. Bears are a very, very good rushing team. Then, of course, there's 363 yards by the Eagles, which is why the Packers defense overall is ranked so poorly, because when you give up nearly 400 yards in a game, it kind kind of inflates things a little bit. But this is one of the worst rushing teams we've gone up against this entire year. Might be the worst. I'm not going to bother looking up who the other teams are, but... It's worth noting. I am, however, going to play this little bit here. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm desperately trying to find some good data on the Vikings. I think I've found one or two things. Still struggling. But here is uh, Mr. Viking himself explaining why, although I acknowledge that, yeah, the Vikings are kind of frauds, I can't help but acknowledge the good that's happened. And here's what he comes up with. But, but, I can't ignore what happened in Buffalo. A one good I game. can't ignore what happened against the Colts. I- an overtime win by three. I can't ignore what happened against your New York Giants on Christmas. The New York Giants was a last-second field goal to beat a garbage team. You can't ignore that. You shouldn't ignore that. Nobody should ignore that. But it doesn't work in the Vikings' favor. You really think that a overtime win, the, the, beating the Colts and the Giants with last-second field goals works in your favor? Again, I understand biggest comeback in NFL history. I get that. But if you think that's to your favor, it's because you're only looking at the second half and ignoring the first half. Uh, I got a clip by Jason Locke on Fora. I'm not going to bother playing it because he basically says the Packers are going to run roughshod over the Vikings defense. It's not what we're looking for. Uh, I want to play this clip from PFF. And and, and again, I don't disagree. This, for the most part, I agree with. Hmm. I just, isn't that... It's just a fascinating line. I mean, whatever about how potentially fraudulent or otherwise Minnesota is, they're, what, 12-3. and three. Um, They keep pulling these games out of the fire. Agreed. And Green Bay, sure, they've gone on a run and they've hauled themselves back into playoff contention. But like, it's, they're still not exactly playing amazingly. Are Agreed. They? I agree with that. Green Bay? Yeah. I think they're better, again, over they the are. last four or five weeks. I think there's... I don't know. I mean, they're both right. The, the The Vikings are a team that wins. The Packers are improved, but still not a very good team. All that's true. How you weigh this, right? If you look at the Packers' defense the last two weeks, they really handled the Rams with Baker Mayfield under center. The, right. The Rams' second string, basically. Yes. Second string that also went out there and scored 44 points on offense on Sunday, plus a pick six. Um, so... That's a new data point. And then in the second half against Miami, they have three interceptions against Tua. The new data point that we have there is he was concussed Mm. during that entire time. Right. They were also getting a little, getting beat up on the ground as they have for a while, and they gave up a slew of big plays. So you look. Not in the second half, though. Not in the second half. So again, this is the narrative that's incorrect. They were getting gashed through the air and on the ground through the entire game but got three picks because Tua was concussed. That's not true. They were getting gashed through the air and on the ground in the first half. They shut down the pass, and they shut down the run, and they got three picks, which are three different things in the second half. But otherwise, I'm tracking with you. Look at their run. They've won four of the last six. Um, yes. When it started See, and again, these are the data points I've been saying that nobody else wants to say. With a win against Dallas, okay? We got losses to Tennessee and Philadelphia. They then beat the Chicago Bears in what was a close game before they uh, pulled away at the end. Then the Rams' second string, and then a concussed Tua, where they were losing for a 
big period of that game until Tua decided to start throwing the ball to them repeatedly. Um, okay, is that like the kind of resume that would make you go, yeah, they should be favorites over the 12-3 and three Minnesota Vikings? Not based on the Packers, but based on the Vikings. There's nothing about the Packers in this last stretch. And by the way, when I say they've been disrespectful, I do, because everyone's saying nonsense to try to make them sound worse than they are. They're not a team on a two-win streak against two garbage teams. They're winning. They've won four out of six against teams including Miami, who everybody said the Packers couldn't beat, uh, and against Dallas. And again, not only are they winning, they're winning well beyond the expectation. They won when they were underdogs against Miami. They overperformed against the Bears and the Rams. So, the, 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 so there's that. But that isn't to say that they're good. Now, the separate question is, now that we've identified what the Packers are, which is a not super great team, but they're better. Their offense is better, although it's still clunky. Their defense is better in spots, although it still looks really bad in spots. Like, they're really bad, but then they really tighten up in the second half. Kind of this weird thing that's going on. Okay, so that's what the Packers are. But now the question is, okay, but what are the Vikings? Because if we're just framing this as... Again, the Packers are only favorites because they're overinflated. I don't think that's true. I think the Packers are exactly seen as what they are, which is a not super great team. But you have to take an honest look at the Vikings and pull them down. It's not that the Packers are are this 13-win team that can compete with this other 12-13 win team. That has nothing to do with it. The Packers are are a middling mediocre team. I'm not saying anything else. What I am saying is the Vikings are too. Vikings? Do you want to to Minnesota's resume? Well, Minnesota's resume defies explanation because they're 12-3 and three with 11 one-score wins um, with the lowest points differential of any 12-3 and three team in NFL history by a mile and somehow keep Do coming it. out with these absurd game endings. Like, I don't even... It's, it just defies any kind of analysis, not even over or under. Yeah, but you should do it anyways. Bat- crazy. Do right. the resume. Exactly. No, do right, it. But that, like, okay, that's why I can see why you would sort of equalize them a little bit. Not what- Exactly my point. Exactly what I'm saying. It's not that the Packers are great, it's that the Vikings aren't. You would go, yeah, Green Bay's three and a half point favorites. I mean, they're, look, if you, t- if you did take the records out of it and just looked at the underlying fundamentals, is there a big difference between these two teams? How they're playing? That's you know, the like question. That? I mean, there's not a big difference. Okay. My question would be, what is it to suggest that Green Bay is better? Home field advantage? Home field advantage. That's Just that's being in Green Bay. We're going with. Just being in Green Bay. That's, I mean, I, I assume that, I mean, that's it, right? Three and a half points. That's pretty much it. Look, I think it's going to be a good game. Um, well, it, it, look, it's, it's clearly not just home field advantage because that doesn't give you that. But there is an element of if this was in Minnesota, would they still be favorites? Probably by a a little bit, but maybe not. Because it's not just that it's in Lambeau, but it's also that it's in December. But again, they're so close, but they don't actually want to do the work. You're right there. right? So we've established the Packers are not that elite. It's not that they're up there in the echelon of the Vikings record. It's that the Vikings are down where the Packers are. And his question was, okay, but are we actually going to say that the Packers should be favored? I don't know. Do the work. You're right there. Who's the better team? That was the question that was posed, and it was the right question. You compare the two teams. Are the Vikings better than the Packers? Well, not necessarily, but are they three and a half points better? I don't know. And, and essentially, they just kind of threw their, he throws his arms up and goes, oh, that's ridiculous. That's, you got to do the work. Throw the record out. Compare the teams. Who's better? Don't just say, well, it's probably because it's Lambo. Oh, well, that's stupid. Well, maybe it's not just because of Lambo. Do the work. Get the numbers. Look it up. That's what we need to, to, to see. I always wonder about division matchups, right? The fact that Minnesota really did a nice job defensively. Remember, this was the game Christian Watson was at the first throw of the season. Aaron Rodgers hits him in stride down the field. He drops it. Um, that's another. Uh, that was another play by uh, the Patrick Peterson, who wants to be an all-pro. You know, it was all for one. It was coverage. Yes, I'm just saying that we, we, you know, you think a little bit. You can. You can think he can't fool you, Mister All Pro Voter. He cannot fool you. You know these you plays. You think of some plays where Patrick you Peterson know. got beat pretty bad. I'm just, uh, you know, outside of that play, the the Vikings did do a really nice job defensively, right? Slowing down the Packers. Is that a trend, right? Is that going to be? Is that something that they have on this Packers offense, or is that that was that was ages ago? That was that was way back. On September 11th of the of of this year, 
And, and again, I, I think Watson's emergence it has changed this Packers offense. Correct. What they're capable of. That has. And then the other really big difference between this time and the last time. The Vikings time defense. No Jair Alexander in the first matchup, right? True. So now you get. Mm. <laughs> no, he was there. <laughs> he, he was in the game. So we're kind of devolving into stuff that. But, but th- th- this is honestly one of the best attempts at actually asking the right questions. It really is. They're just not answering the questions, right? And, and again, Christian Watson has changed this offense, okay? And the Vikings' defense, significantly worse. Again, they didn't start off as the 32nd-ranked defense. They became that. Get to see, all right, how does Green Bay try and stop the unstoppable Justin Jefferson? Do they deploy Jair Alexander on him one-on-one? You know Jair is going to be campaigning for that. Do they you know, try and take him away by other means? And does anything they do work? Because nothing, pretty much anybody... Well, and here's my thought. I, it doesn't matter what we do. We're not shutting down Justin Jefferson. Nobody's been able to do it. He's on a, a, a record-breaking pace right now. If we put him, Justin Jefferson, or if we put Jair on him, Jair is going to get cooked. If we try to try to minimize it with zone coverages or different kinds of whatever coverages to try to slowly take him away a little bit, it's not going to work. But this was true in week one. And again, week one was a complete disaster. There were so many just absolute blown coverages, and they managed 23 points. 23. That's it. It wasn't 43. It wasn't even 33. It was 23. With Justin Jefferson playing at a really high clip, the Packers' defense playing horribly, and just blown coverages across the board. Not just Justin Jefferson cooking, guys. I'm just talking Packers not knowing where he is on the field and him just getting lost out there. So that's, that's my only thing. I'm 100% terrified of Justin Jefferson. He's an elite wide receiver, and I know we cannot and will not take him away. I have no illusions about that. We don't have anybody good enough to do that. We don't have a defensive coordinator good enough to do that. We don't have what it takes to do that. But we didn't in week one, and they managed 23 points. That's where I'm at. Everybody else has done has managed to work against Justin Jefferson. So that, to me, is the most interesting dynamic in all of this. You know, Jefferson is on his way potentially to an unprecedented season a year after the last unprecedented season yes. in this offense. So I'm on board with that, 100%. That, so, but again, we're, 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 we're not growing any further understanding here. Justin Jefferson is terrifying. Yep. The Packers' defense is going to have a hard time slowing down the Vikings' offense. Yeah, probably. That's, that's baked into the cake. What else we got? I'm, I'm, I'm scouring. For new information. Um, I know we're running long here, but we're just going to end up doing that. Um, I'm going to get to the end, which is essentially me saying that nobody really seems to have any more information, so I'll do the work myself. But I found this interesting because this is something I've said that I've not heard anybody else say. Uh, This is a a, uh, gambling betting uh, YouTube channel called NFL Picks and Predictions talking about Vikings Packers. This guy, Chris Farley, has been talking, yes, that's his name, for quite a while. Um, Says he picks the Packers to win. And uh, talks about week one and how, you know, the, the Packers had a, a walk-in touchdown and he dropped it and that kind of changed everything after that. Um, but then he has this to say. But we'll see. Christian Watson may not play in this game because he has a hip injury, but I don't think it matters because the biggest correlation for me for the Packers' offensive success and for their wins has been in their run game. When Thank they you. When they get over 138 yards on the ground, they're 5-1 and one straight up, and they can run – on the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings are bottom third NFL defense against the run, allow four and a half yards per carry. They are the last place team against the pass over 281 yards per game allowed. And, and this is going back to Lambeau Field, right? It's back in an environment where Aaron Rodgers is going to be comfortable. The offense is moving the ball more. And the Vikings, let's face it, are, are, are still probably going to get theirs. You can definitely run on the Packers. You know, so Dalvin Cook should be able to get some good yards in this one. Opens up play action pass. So I really like the over, but I really like Green Bay in this one too, even though that's not an official play. So maybe you'll look to parlay that. So I, I, again, it's one thing to just say, oh, the Packers are overrated. They've been getting lucky. That's not data. That's, I watched it. And, and, and that's what a lot of fans like to do. They'll, they'll say the data is stupid. Just watch the games. If you watch it, you can see the Vikings are a good team and the Packers aren't. I'm sorry. Data matters. And you can be mad at numbers if you want. But the context of the wins is built into 
the numbers, the data, the information. You can find it. You can find context behind the wins, behind the losses. And if you want a contextless, uh, fan-biased perspective of a game that I watched that I got excited about while I was jumping up and down doing backflips and slamming a six-pack, and you want me to take that, your biased perspective, over the context and the data, I can't do it. And so again, just basic numbers. like the, What is the correlation for the Packers when they win? It's, it's their ability to run the ball. Can they run the ball on the Vikings? Yes, they can. The Vikings are terrible at stopping the run. Oh, by the way, this is the worst passing defense in the entire NFL, so the Packers are also going to be able to throw the ball. Therefore, Packers at home in December in Lambeau, it makes sense to go Packers. Thank you. Anyways, here's some more data. Again, I was trying to find pro Vikings data, but I'll, 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 I'll accept any data. And this is, again, why I like betting guys, because they go deep into the data and deep into the numbers. Here's the same show. The other guy, he basically said, I agree with what, you know, I'm not going to bet on this game. Uh, I don't really like a lot of the numbers or whatever. However, uh, here's my thoughts on the game that I find interesting. I think, you know, the, the, the biggest difference in these teams is when you look at red zone touchdown percentage, the Vikings, uh, Green Bay has been kind of consistent, uh, and on offense, they're actually very good at home, uh, and on the road, they've struggled a little bit, um, where in the Vikings, uh, defensively at home, they're very good. They're ninth best at home. On the road, though, and defensively, they're sixth worst on the road, and now you couple that with a uh, Packer defense that I think is uh, ninth best at home, uh, and offensively, the Vikings are seventh best in the league, scoring in the red zone touchdowns and 26 best on the road. So there's just a big dichotomy here for the Vikings home and away. Uh, and if that rears its ugly head again, then Green Bay is going to roll in this game. Uh, if the Vikings can overcome that, then it's going to be a close game. Again, what does the data say? We, 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 the fact that, I mean, this is not even hard to look this stuff up. It's really not. It doesn't take that much time. And I know a lot of these, they got to cover 32 teams or 16 different games. I can't be going this in depth or whatever, but to sit here and, and to have a show that is primarily just, I watched it and here's how I feel, is embarrassing. Who are the Vikings? I, I did this with Kirk Cousins, too. Kirk Cousins is better than Rodgers. Fair enough. What about home and away? Well, Rodgers is significantly better at home than Cousins is on the road. So, I mean, if we're just talking in general, fine. But that's irrelevant in this case. Now, that will change however if the Packers win this game and win next week and get into the playoffs and then go to Minnesota everything flips on its head and everything that he just said flips on its head the Packers on the road in the red zone pretty bad the Vikings at home in the red zone offensively and defensively quite good but you know what they're playing in Lambeau the Packers are a different team in Lambeau right they've struggled in the red zone not at home so much you're thinking about the last couple games where they've been on the road at home not so much same with defense Packers defensively in the red zone are not great unless we're talking about at home. And again, the Vikings the Vikings have been doing, I don't know if you'd say good or whatever, but remember, the Vikings have been a, a, on a home stretch. The Packers have been on an away stretch. Not every game, obviously. They've been, they've been home for a couple, but mostly that's why the, the Packers' last couple games are at home. But, but you can go down the line with all this stuff. And I'm going to pull up some things that are just on the season why the Packers are, are generally better, but it, it gets even worse. And it's like he said, if the Vikings overcome these deficiencies of being on the road uh, as compared to the, the the Packers at home, then it will be close. If they can't, he says the Packers are going to run away with this. And you know what? I think there's data to support that. So let's do this because I've, I've gone through several different channels and it's, it's largely the stuff that we've already heard, whether that be pro Vikings, pro Packers, and it's a lot of the same argumentation. I think PFF got the closest in asking the right questions, but not answering it. Then they just kind of went into like, well, I'm just going to kind of go off the cuff here with my answer rather than just looking at it. The question that is posed isn't, so I, I guess the biggest issue I have with the pro Vikings thing, and I don't have any issue with calling it a coin flip if that's what you think, just kind of off the cuff. I, I, my gut says, honestly, my gut says the Vikings win because I'm just scared and I, I've watched the Packers look terrible and I've seen the Vikings just continually win. So my gut says the Vikings are going to win the game. But that's not the point. If we're just going off our gut, then there's no point in having a, a YouTube channel and trying to pretend that we're experts at anything. The biggest problem I have is the idea that we're presupposing that the reason the line is being set is because everybody is overestimating the Packers. 
We don't have any data to support that. We don't have any reason to believe that. We just think Vegas must be so stupid that they actually believe that because the Packers beat the Bears and the Rams and a concuss Tua, that everybody thinks the Packers are the greatest team in football, and therefore they're overestimating how good they are, and that's stupid, and therefore the line's bad. The problem is you don't know that that's the reason, and you're not even beginning to explore the Minnesota Vikings and the quality. So the the question that was posed by um, PFF, or at least one of the guys, don't remember his name, but is, is this Vikings team better than the Green Bay Packers? Can you sit here and tell me definitively that they're better? And if so, how much better? And, and, and then you look at home and away and all that kind of stuff. The question comes down to not just wins and losses, but quality. And there is a website that's very well known that tracks quality of wins, quality of losses, quality of the offense, quality of the defense, quality of the special teams. And there's a couple different ways that you can do this, but let's just look overall. Through the entire season, from week one through week 16, not worrying about home and away or any of that stuff, just raw data based on the quality of the team. They have the Green Bay Packers defense as being 2.8% worse than your average defense. Minnesota, 4.8% worse. So the Packers just straight up have a better defense. Okay, what about offense? And I think most people will concede the Packers have a mildly better, although still bad defense. But offensively, Minnesota is significantly better. Do you know where Green Bay ranks? Green Bay has, according to Football Outsiders, the 10th best offense, 8.2% better than your average team. You know where Minnesota ranks? 19th, 2.3% worse than your average offense. You think, well, that's absolutely freaking absurd. There is no chance. That's impossible. Let's look at weighted DVOA for the offense. That is to say, more recent history. They have Green Bay moving from 10th to 9th, from 8.2% to 9.1%. In other words, they're getting better. 9.1% better than your average offense. By the way, average offense in this context would be the Raiders or more recently Pittsburgh. Minnesota stays at 19th. However, they go from being 2.3% worse than your average offense to 4.2% worse than your average offense. You say, how could you possibly say that? Look how many points they're scoring. Well, here's what we can do. Let's look at Minnesota's offensive DVOA. Let's do it on a week-to-week basis. Week one, 22.4% better than your average offense against the Packers. Week two against Philly, negative 22. Detroit, 15. New Orleans, negative 11.7. 6.7 for Chicago, negative 6.4 against Miami. 12.8 against Arizona, negative 12.1 against Washington, negative 9.9 against Buffalo. And and keep in mind, it's not, well, that's because Buffalo is a good defense. No, that's that's compared to everybody else against Buffalo specifically. That's the whole point of this. It's not just how good was your offense or defense. It's based on the circumstance, based on Buffalo, home and away. All these different things are baked in. What is the expectation and how good of a job did you do compared to that expectation? Dallas, negative 48.9. And everybody's favorite game, Indy, where the Vikings came back in the second half, negative 18.3 offensive DVOA in that game. So the point is, According to Football Outsiders, the Minnesota Vikings offense has actually underwhelmed. In other words, the average offense would have scored more points against these opponents at these times in these games. To be more specific, the Vikings are averaging 25.2 points per game, which is a lot. With Minnesota being 2.3% worse than your average team, that 25.2 should be closer to about 25.8 which isn't that big of a difference, but that's, that's the point. An average offense, according to Football Outsiders, given the opponents and the defenses at those given times, the, an average team would score about 25.8 points per game. So with all that, let's do what it is that I usually do, and we're going to do it from a couple different angles. But let's just say, given the quality of the Packers' offense and defense compared to Minnesota's Minnesota's overall offense and defense and how good of a job they've done in comparison to how good of a job they should have done. Again, remember, Minnesota is underwhelming by about two and a half, uh, two, well, yeah, about two and a half percent as far as how many points they score. So just as a baseline, generally the Packers score about 
well, it's 20.9, so about 21 points a game. They give up about 22 points a game. Minnesota scores about 25 points a game. They give up about 25 points a game. 25.2 compared to 24.9. However, again, looking at this, let's look at what Minnesota, what you would expect from Minnesota based on how Green Bay generally does. And this time I'm going to lean a little bit more on weighted because it's just a little bit more accurate in terms of what the team is right now. So the Packers offense is 9.1% better than your average team. So if Minnesota is giving up an average of 24.9 points and the Packers are 9.1% better than your average team, that means the Packers, you would expect to score about 2.2659 more points than your average team. That puts the Packers at 27.16. We'll call it 27. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put the official in there just because it'll help some tiebreakers, but 27.16, 27.2. The Vikings generally score 25.2 points. Green Bay's defense, weighted defense, DVOA, 1.2% worse than your average defense. So they, they're going to give up to the Vikings probably about 0.3 points more which moves them from 25.2 to 25.5. So if you look at Minnesota Vikings score using the Packers DVOA, the score of the game will be Packers win 27-25 or 27-26 if you round up. Very close. Let's look at the other side. The Packers score about 21 points a game. They give up about 22. Minnesota's weighted DVOA on offense is negative 4.2. So 4.2 points worse than average. So the Vikings should score about 0.94 points less than what the Packers usually give up, putting the Packer or the Vikings score at 21.4. If you look at the Packers general score of 20.9 points compared to their the, the Vikings DVOA, the Vikings defense is 5.4% worse than your average defense. So the Packers should be expected to score about 1.1 points more, putting it at 22. So in both cases, it's very close. So again, when people say three and a half points is too much, I think that's fair. If you look at the score total, one score total has it 25-27, the other one is 21-22. What's really interesting, and I'm not going to walk you through the step-by-step, but I looked at Packers home versus Vikings away. Honestly, it's not that different. The numbers shift only slightly. And in every case, so we have four different score totals. Every single score total has the Packers winning. Every single score total has the Vikings covering. So I told you the first two score totals. Here's the other two with the with looking at Green Bay at home and the Vikings away. Uh, 29 to 27-ish. So it's 28.8, 26.6. So that's 2.2 points for the Packers. The other score total is 22 to 20. Officially 22 to 20.27. And so it's it's really, really similar. You've got 27 to 26, and then you've got 29, 27. And then you got the other two scores, 22, 21, or 22 to 20. So again, is this a close game? Yes, it is. Do I think the Packers should be picked to win this game? Yes, I do. Do I think the Packers are generally better? Yes, I do, because again, even if you don't do home and away, now, granted, this may change if you put them in the Viking Stadium, but if you're, if you're just talking about a neutral stadium, I think you pick the Packers. That's what the first two score totals were, 27-26 and 22-21. That's at a neutral field, essentially. So I do think that the Packers are too strong of favorites at three and a half, and I do think the Vikings are a good pick, and I think that's why you're hearing people say um, the Packers to win, the Vikings to cover. I, I think that's the, the most reasonable take you can have with this. Now, the bad news is when you're talking about, you know, how close a one-score game is and all that, so when, when you're talking about one or two points, favorites, that's a coin flip. And I think that's what this is. And that's what I've been saying that this game is. It is a coin flip. And, and both teams have reasons to believe that they can win. But it's very easy to see losses because you're looking at two teams that when they're at their best, they look unstoppable. When they're at their worst, they are the worst thing ever. And the Vikings are probably the biggest embodiment of that. I think they're better than the Packers at their best. I think they're worse than the Packers at their worst, which seems shocking because we've seen the Packers bad. But did you see the Colts game? That was simultaneously the Vikings at their worst and their best. Only the Vikings, only the Vikings, there isn't one other team 
that could have been down 33 against the garbage Colts at halftime than the Vikings. No other team could have pulled that off. Also, I don't know if the if the freaking Chiefs could have come back down 33. So what am I supposed to hang my hat on here? Ultimately, what this comes down to is I think the Packers are marginally better than the Vikings. But it really is just going to come down to which team is going to show up. Which team wants it more? That's the bottom line. Maybe both teams come out a little bit flat. Who's flatter? Maybe both teams come out hot. Who's hotter? But if you got one team coming out hot and one team coming out flat, it will be a blowout, period. And that could be in the Packers' favor very easily. Defense is trash. That could be in the Vikings' favor. Defense is kind of trash. So, you know, I, 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 that, that is my official prediction. A very close Packers win. But I don't know. I don't really have uh, a strong beat on this game other than to say, well, the two things. Number one, it's going to come down to who wants it more. And number two, don't turn the game off until the last second. Both of these teams are very well known for giving their fan bases heart attacks, especially the Vikings this year, the Packers pretty much historically. Both teams have uh, track records of doing things in the fourth quarter, Packers defense, Vikings offense. Personally, I just want to get it over with. It, you know, I, I, I wish if we were going to go out, it would have been to the, to the Dolphins last week. I don't want the Vikings to be the ones to kick us out. I hope we win, but th- this is really just, I'm just so stressed that what if we lose? That's going to suck so bad. And on top of that, you, you know what's going to happen. Oh, I thought we were frauds. What happened? I thought the Packers were better. Listen, that has nothing to do with the data. The Packers, I believe, are marginally better than the Vikings. Does that mean that they are guaranteed to beat the Vikings? Of course not, because we're not all idiots. Just like if the Packers beat the Vikings, I could still be wrong about the Packers being marginally better than the Vikings. If you have better data to support it, then go with that data. It doesn't really matter. This game won't definitively prove anything one way or another. It'll just further somebody's opinion. It's one more data point. All I know is I'm terrified, and I'm not looking forward to this game. And it, it, it really does suck because, you know, as I'm listening to all these different videos and you listen to everybody say the Packers are not that good, the Packers are not that good, it doesn't matter if they get in because they're good. The, the reality is I feel the same way. And so it's like, man, we got to sit here and hopefully not lose to the Vikings just because I don't want to lose to the Vikings. Not because I think we have a shot in the playoffs, but because I just don't want them to knock. And then we have to beat the Lions because I don't want them to knock us out. But then we got to go into the playoffs. And we'll reevaluate things after this. I mean, if they crush the Vikings, we got to reevaluate it. Maybe the Packers are better than we thought. I don't know. And by the way, this is all assuming that all these other guys play. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with all the injuries and who's playing and who's not. It looks like somewhat positive news, especially for the offensive tackles playing. But I don't know. Anyways, uh, we'll leave it at that for now. That, that's, that's where I'm at. This is, this is officially a coin flip. The Packers should win at home, but it's probably going to be a very close game. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're talking official betting purposes, Packers win, Vikings cover. And that's not a fun spot to be in because you know how volatile these teams are. That little one, two point difference, it doesn't mean a single thing. So it's, it's literally a coin flip. Flip a coin. That's all you got to do. People talk about the Packers match up well against the Vikings. Vikings match up well against the Packers. Well, of course, because you have, you have a team that does well when they run the ball against a defense that sucks, and also they do well when they pass the ball, like every team, and the defense sucks. And you got the Vikings, whose strength is their offense, up against a defense who tends to have issues getting carved up. Even if they tighten up in the fourth quarter, they like to get gashed. Big plays through the air, big plays on the ground, 400 yards rushing to the Eagles. It's their favorite pastime of, hey, let's see how many big chunk yards we can give you. Of course, both teams match up very well against the other team, because in reality, they're kind of similar. And, and, and the, again, the thing that scares me is, is the way that you see this game is kind of a blow-for-blow blow shootout, but if, what if one of the teams doesn't show up on offense? Then it's a blowout. It goes from being a shootout to a blowout if one team stumbles out of the gate even, which is why I will say this. You better hit, or, hit fast, hit early, and don't take your foot off their throat because if you come out stumbling, it'll be 14 nothing real fast. Watch, it's going to be a 10-3 to game. Anyways, uh, this is going on way too long. I'm going to leave it at that. Listen, I, I, I called it a coin flip against Miami. I think it was. I called it a coin flip against Minnesota. I think it was. We'll see what, what Detroit is, but I'm, I'm, it's more or less a coin flip. You guys have yourselves a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.